Moving Wisconsin forward one joke at a time, this is Kristen Bry with As Goes Wisconsin. Yada, yada, yada. Hello, Wisconsin! Hello, Wisconsin. Welcome to the 11 o'clock hour of As Goes Wisconsin. I am your host, Kristen Bry, along with Jane Matinair on the board. And if you have watched 60 Minutes or any environmental documentary, you've probably seen the tons and tons of plastics that gets accumulated in landfills and in our oceans. And it's largely because a lot of our plastics can't be recycled. Some can, but a lot can't. And But now there is uh, a University of Wisconsin-Madison professor and a Green Bay company that are working together to upscale a new recycling technique that could help keep plas- flexible plastics out of landfills. And so I'm so excited to welcome UW-Madison chemical and biological engineering professor George Huber to the show to talk about this project and this process. How are you doing, Professor Huber? I'm doing great, Kristen. Thank you for having me on the show. So this sounds very nerdy, but also very important. And so I'm excited to talk to you. And before we jump into what the process, the the technique is, why is it that so many of our plastics can't, like, can't be recycled? Yeah, it's because there's such a wide variety of plastics that we use and produce. You know, we, we really live today in the plastic age. We use plastic in our clothing. Plast- our cars are basically made of different plastics. Our computers are made of plastics. Everything's plas- packaged in plastics. But they're all different types of plastics that we produce. And then, um, you know, we put all these colors in your plastics to make our products sell better on the yeah. store. And that makes it more challenging to recycle. And so, because I do, you do think about that. I think about just the packaging of almost, of just groceries, how much plastic you go through just in a single grocery trip of the smaller bag to put your, to like separate your produce. And then that goes into a bigger bag and, and the packaging on, like you have to un, un, do plastic to get through some of your food. And so that's kind of some of the stuff that we're talking about when we talk about flexible plastic, right? Like that's the kind of wrappers and packaging that we can't recycle. Yeah, that's right. Um, there's there's rigid plastics like your water bottle. Um, and most recycling, most organizations will take rigid plastics that are at least clear and clean and a single component. But flexible packages like your Grocery bags are more challenging to recycle. You're starting to see some stores like Target and uh, Pick and Save starting to set up out uh, re- bins to recycle to cl- start collecting those flexible packages, at least the monolayer flexible package. But most of your flexible packages, several layers. So you put several different packages together um, and, and that makes your you use less packaging material, makes your food last longer, your your healthcare products stay safer, but it's more challenging to recycle. So. Absolutely. So then, with and the, and actually, I, this is I read this in an article where I found out about the project that you guys are working on. Um, Wisconsin has a is has a big industry for packaging, right? Yeah, you know, our, our football team is the Packers, right? Yeah. Um, there's a reason why we're the Packers. It's because we're good at packaging things. The first thing we packaged a lot of things was cardboard and glass. Um, over time, that's shifted to package more and more plastics, package more and more things in pla- pa- plastic, uh, mainly because it's cheaper. Your products last longer. Uh, and, and we don't manufacture these plastics in Wisconsin. Most of them are manufactured in Texas. But there's whole train cars and barges being sent to Wisconsin with huge pellets where we make a wide variety of packaging material. A lot of innovations in plastic packaging, how to package cheese, how to package different materials has really happened in Wisconsin. It's a super important industry in Wisconsin. And I think in the, in the whole U.S., we're the number third state in flexible packaging materials. Wow. I did not know that. There's always like certain exports, like when you find out that like we're like the number one exporter of cranberries or um, bovine genetics, <laughs> and then you're like, oh yeah, it's more than just cheese and brats. Um, so then, what is solvent targeted recovery and preci- uh, precipitation? Yeah. So the, the the challenge with plastics is you have contamination, you have mixture. Okay. So you can imagine one one challenge is the the shrink wrap you put around boxes. You put that shrink wrap around, there's dirt that gets in there, there's adhesives that get stuck in there. We can take solvents 
Okay, so we pick a solvent, it absorbs the polyethylene, leaves behind the dirt, we precipitate it out, and then we make a pure plastic material that can then be recycled for the virgin material. Or we have, uh, in, in these flexible packages, oftentimes they're what's called multi-layer material. So you'll add what's called an oxygen barrier. The oxygen barrier helps your food last longer. Okay, a lot of energy goes to produce the food. So we can pull out the polyethylene, pull out the oxygen barrier. Well, you can't recycle that multi-layer film. That multi-layer film right now has to go to landfill or be burned. So we have a technology to be able to recycle that. It uses a solvent. We, we, we design a solvent to, to basically pull out the plastic we want and leave behind everything else that we then precipitate it. And then we can remake the original packaging material. That sounds fast. Like I said, very nerdy, but fascinating. So basically it's, it can replace... This can replace the pack, like the, the saran wrap type things that we, I, I keep thinking of um, the plastic wrap that used to come on CDs. Of course, we don't buy CDs anymore, but that kind of plastic wrap, this is, this could replace that. Yeah. Or, or you could remake that, that flexible food packaging. You know, you buy your potato chips and a multi-layer plastic packaging material. We can pull out different components of that. And then you could remake that, um, that potato chip bag. And right now you can't, that potato chip bag, it's very complex. There's several different layers. There's, there's actually about 20 different layers that go into making that, that potato chip bag. A lot of science, a lot of technology go into making that potato chip bag, actually. Really? Yeah. That is fascinating. I had no idea. Go ahead, Jane. So if, if we just had one design for a bag of Cheetos puffs that was clear that just had black printing on it, would that alleviate the need for all of these layers? Well, the, you, you, you could do that and companies are doing that, but that will require you to make a thicker plastic material. So you'll actually have to add more plastic to do that. So what the industry does is they add these different layers together to prevent less oxygen, prevent water going on. People like their bags to open up easily, close easily. Um, Printing is very challenging. You know, we like products that look nice on the shelf. You know, yeah. people will pay more for a product that has fancier printing on the shelf. Making it simpler printing will make it easier to be recycled. But we like that, uh, you know, that that marketing aspect of, of the product that we make. So then with it's so the, the uh, acronym is called STRAP for the, the process, mm -hmm. process that you guys have created. So it's it's done, it works. But now basically the next step is to figure out a way to actually commercialize it and have companies use, use this method? Well, there's actually a team of researchers here at University of Wisconsin. You know, we have really one of the best engineering schools in the country here who have, are really working on this. We have a lot of different companies who are focused on this. Actually, the three largest manufacturers of polyethylene and polypropylene are sitting down helping us design this. Amcor, who's at Nina, Wisconsin, their U.S. headquarters, they're the world's largest packaging manufacturers helping us with this. So we, there, there are so many different types of materials to dump. We've demonstrated in the laboratory. We've taken our products back to the manufacturer, tested them, remade film with in, in, in Amcor. Um, but it took us about four months to produce two kilograms of two pounds of material. Okay. Uh, the, the company wants us to make ton quantities of material. So we can't do that in the university setting. So, well, at University of Wisconsin, we don't have the resources. So we've designed a system at uh, Michigan Tech University to be able to produce 25 kilograms an hour of recycled material. And then after that, you know, we think when, when, when we've designed most of that, we built maybe 70% of the system. We hope next year will be operational. We can successfully demonstrate this on a larger scale. And then after that, we hope to build a 500 kilogram per hour system in Green Bay, Wisconsin. We have a location picked out. We have customers who want the product who will be providing us with feedstock. Uh, it looks economical. It has lower greenhouse gas emissions, 60 to 70% lower greenhouse gas emissions. You know, plastic, the plastic industry is critical for Wisconsin and we want to make sure the plastic recycling industry stays in Wisconsin. So in your experience, obviously, uh, we're talking to UW-Madison chemical and, and biological engineer, uh, engineering professor, George Huber. So you were on the science research development side of plastics. When you've worked with plastic companies, like in your experience, is there the good faith desire for plastic companies to find more renewable ways that are still economical 
to do this. Cause sometimes you think of like, as you see those pictures of just like so much plastic and you think of like, there has to like, why is there not a d- more of an effort to just use less or find different ways? Like is, is that effort there? And it's just behind the scenes for most of the public. Yeah, there, there is a tremendous amount of effort right now. It's mainly being driven by consumers or consumers are demanding more and more recycled material. We, we really don't think about end of life use when we buy products. You know, we don't think yeah. about what happens. We go to the grocery store or we go shopping, we buy something, but we don't think about what happens at end of life use of, of our products. And uh, especially with the plastic industry, it's a huge challenge for them. And they are, they are very concerned about some of the challenge. There's legislation coming up. Uh, Europe, Europe is way ahead of us than I think we are in the U.S. with with some some of these technologies. Um, but it's it's a critical thing. I think we need to rethink about plastics. Is how can we make the plastic industry more sustainable? Uh, the, the the companies are investing some money. Of course, we'd like them to continue to invest money and mm-hmm. invest in the the strap technology and make that here in Wisconsin. You know, absolutely. I mean, because that's I think that's the thing that's exciting about this is. Not only is the research happening at UW Madison in Wisconsin, but it's also could directly benefit, you know, an, a, a huge industry, as we just said, as far as it being the third, we're the third, the third biggest state with packaging, um, to really be innovative and like at the fr- front lines of trying to balance convenience and all of the things that plastics give us, while still being able to not just pollute. <laughs> yeah, no, that's right. And, and you know, the, the, the packaging manufacturers, they're, they're going back to your comment, you know, making the materials of a single material, you know, that, that's more easy to recycle, but it's thicker, it costs more, and it's not as good for the environment. So it's hard. All right. to Absolutely. Well, uh, George, this was so much fun. It's super interesting. I can't wait to see how this develops and, uh, you know, potentially in a couple years, see this be a commercialized process. So uh, Professor George Huber uh, works at UW-Madison as a chemical and biological engineering professor. Thank you so much for spending time with us today. Thank you, All right. Let's take a break. We'll be right back. Welcome back to As Goes Wisconsin. I am Kristen Bry. She is Jane Matinair. Did you know that we did that much packaging here? No, and actually, we didn't have a chance to get him on the air, but uh, Paul called, who works in the packaging industry, and uh, who knew this was so incredibly complicated? He was explaining some of the processes to me and all of the layers, and I I just had no idea. And, And Paul said as well, just like Professor Huber, that packaging is a big industry in Wisconsin. Wait. Look at what we... Look at what we learn. But look at what we learn some days when you're just I know. curious and you're like, I, you know, some, we may lose some listeners during this topic, but I'm going to learn something. <laughs> it, I think it's just fascinating. I really do. And so, yeah. And it's, it's, I think it's so fascinating to take also the leap from, you know, the, the type of research that happens at our university system you know, and I think about the different professors that we've had on, the different scientists we've had on. Like I think back to um, the professor we had on who was studying mice on coke. Oh, and- yes. <laughs> and and the translation that hopefully eventually happens from that research into daily lives, and you know, and 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 it is a process, right? Like as Professor Huber was saying, being able to take what they've developed and apply the economies of scale and be able to actually quickly economically produce the amount that they would need to produce for this to be a viable replacement. Um, and like how you take things out of academia and into the mainstream and like the obstacles that come with that. And that's why I thought it was an interesting story as far as what they're developing and also working alongside with like actual private businesses that are invested in trying to also see if there's a more viable, sustainable way to do this. I I just am so impressed by the long-term dedication and the patience of these researchers, because you don't get results for God. You may never get the end result before you die. And instead of throwing up their hands and saying, yeah, I'm going to do something easier. They just keep at it. It's it's I, I I'm really awestruck by that. 
Especially as someone who has ADHD and is constantly oh. interested in like multiple things, but never dives too deep in any of it. It's like, it's amazing to me the um, dedication to one topic that some people can just like have that laser focus in for decades of their decades. lives. Seriously. Uh, Cause I'm like on to the next thing very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's why we cover thing. a lot of, that's why we cover a lot of topics on this yeah, show. Yeah, exactly. So that, that's not an expert in literally anything. <laughs> <laughs> but you know a lot about a lot of stuff. I can talk, little- I can have a conversation about a lot of different things, but you know, shallow. <laughs> and this is again, why we bring on the experts, the experts. Um, so speaking of packaging and Wisconsin, uh, coming to a cereal aisle near you soon, former Badgers, JJ and TJ Watt are going to make history next month as the first pair of brothers featured on a Wheaties box. That is pretty cool. That so, really yeah. is. It is, it is cool, especially because I think everything, unless they are very good at hiding it, uh, so and especially JJ, the how good of people they are and how much they give back, um, it's easy to easy to root for them. But obviously, JJ retired from the NFL last year after 11 seasons and three defensive player uh, wins of the year. And then TJ is entering his seventh season with the Steelers and is a four-time All-Pro selection. And the box hits shelves in August. So are you a, I'm are sure you a, a dry cereal eater. <laughs> Funny you should ask that, Jane. So we'll just go quickly on this tangent before uh, in our next segment we're actually going to have a childcare success story and uh, an example of when the community can come together and, and solve this issue, but. Before we get to that in the next segment, let me uh, let me tell you, I for growing up, yes, and I haven't I haven't bought a box of cereal in so long until this week, and so I've gone through like I don't have any weird cravings so much as far as the pregnancy stuff. Like there's yet no to be like oh like like pickles and ice cream or like like right. weird combinations, but I've just gone through phases. Like I went through a watermelon phase but I was very disappointed. Like I've yet to be able to find a good watermelon. I've looked up so many YouTube videos on how to pick a good watermelon. And I feel like I'm following all the advice and I think Uh, they're just getting picked too soon to like meet demand in the grocery stores. So I've gone through that. I now am making my own Italian ice at home because I'm going through like a chewing on ice phase. And I'm also going on like as of this week, a cereal phase because my heart burns back. And so I have to find things that I can like eat and like milk helps a lot. Sure. And so like, and so I looked up like, what can you eat when you have heartburn? It's basically like whole grains, milk. What else is on that list? I don't know. There's a ton of stuff that just flares it up. So like right now, it's not even that I'm craving cereal so much as much as it's like, this is one thing that is somewhat healthy that I can eat. If I get cereal, that doesn't have a huge amount of sugar in it. Sure. And milk. And so that is my phase that I am in for at least this week (laughs) is dry cereal like I'm seven years old. (laughs) Well, there's that, you know, that's uh, that lazy sphincter acting up again. That lazy sphincter. You know, for a little while I had a reprieve, but uh, it's back. It is back. It's annoying. God, it's annoying. It's painful. (laughs) Um, All right. When we come back, Gabby Serrano, who is the owner and director of the Antico Child Care Center, is going to be here to talk about because she's basically this is her year anniversary from when she first started uh, the Antico Child Care Center last year. And the story to how she got it done is a great example of collaboration and partnership with the business community. And so I'm really excited to have you hear more about that story and hear what she thinks other communities can take away from that success story. So stick around. This is As Goes Wisconsin. Welcome back to As Goes Wisconsin. I am Kristen Bry. She is Jane Matinair, and I'm so excited to talk to our next guest. Uh, we've been talking about childcare on and off for the last couple months as far as the crisis that we're in and the potential ways to uh fix it and how it's, you know, it's something that affects everyone, even those people without kids. And yet it feels like a solution that is being left to parents and childcare providers alone, despite the fact that governments and businesses have a lot to gain by actually collaborating. So 
We are excited to talk about an innovative solution that happened up in Antigo, Wisconsin. So Gabby Serrano is the owner of Ant and owner and director of Antigo Child Care Center. How are you doing, Gabby? Good. Thank you for having me today. Absolutely. So you're this is your year anniversary, right? Yeah, it's so crazy to think as of last week, Monday, Antigo Child Care Center has been open for one year already. That is wild. And so I guess you and your background is in teaching, right? And before, uh, teaching like high, the elementary school children, not daycare before you started this center, right? Correct. So prior to opening the center, I was a second grade teacher for the past nine years. Um, I grew up working in the child care industry in high school and college. And that is kind of what brought me back into this industry. So what uh, what was kind of the catalyst for you to say, I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and open a child care center, despite the fact that I'm sure there were warnings as far as how hard it could be. Or maybe there wasn't any warning. Maybe you just thought you could do, like it would be needed. So there'd be a lot of support for it. Yeah, actually, my mom was the human resources director of a child care center to India. Gave me plenty of to dive in with two feet anyways. Um, so throughout COVID, our son lost his spot at a local child care center here. And Anago is not a large city. And during COVID, the other, so we have two licensed group centers here. The other center closed due to COVID and staffing and all the struggles um, in the industry. And it really brought to light that we don't have many options here in our community. So that, I got the wild idea and ran with it since. Well, I, that, and that that's what I think is so impressive because you saw places close and yet we're like, well, we got to open another one. Because truly, as far as the people, when you would talk to people in your community, when those Beside, including yourself, when those centers closed, like what were what were people even doing? Were they just quitting their jobs? Were they changing jobs? Like what what was the alternative prior to you opening the Antico Child Care Center? Right, and I think that's where I've been working very closely with with our Economic Development Corporation, and I think it was very opening, eye opening to a lot of people how childcare and the workforce really go hand in hand. That without childcare options in our area, families aren't able to work or have both parents in the workforce, and um, it really brought to light that there is that very large need in our community for childcare. Because in your county. I think I read this. It's basically, is it even with your center open, is it still considered a childcare desert? Yes. Um, we actually just had a meeting with our county's child care task force and Langley County is considered a child care desert that there are approximately 650 kids in Langley County and only about 200 child care slots available. Wow. <sighs> That's including wow. family providers, not just group centers. And what is the difference if, for people who are un, un, unsure of what the difference between family providers and centers are? Sure. So a group, um, a group center is where there are um, more than seven children in the okay. center, and a family child care provider is someone who does it out of their home. Got it. Okay. Um, so we're talking to Gabby Serrano, who is the owner and director of Antigo Child Care Center, which is celebrating a year of being open this month. And in the jumping for two feet for face forward, whatever you want to say, as far as taking this on, what was that experience like? I'll tell you that I would have not been able to done, do it without all the support of um, many community members. Yeah. So as I have mentioned, um, working very closely with the Economic Development Corporation, their executive director, Angie Close, helped set me up with a lot of partnerships and collaborative relationships in our community. And um, also, I the space that I am in is through our local housing authority, and they actually renovated the entire space on their cost to make sure that it was a safe and updated space for the center. So, so some of it, I mean, as far as the challenges that come into it's finding a space, it's finding the people. Um, what were some of the unexpected things that you thought would be easier that were actually really difficult to get done? 
I'd say most recently is that the child care industry lost our state funding. Yeah. Um, that uh, approximately for a small center like mine, we would receive about six to seven thousand dollars a month. Now, going into this business, I knew that wasn't guaranteed funding. That is still funds that were available from the COVID relief um, during that time frame. Um, but I guess I anticipated that the pandemic and the highlight that it really brought um, child care and the workforce together, that there would have been a greater push for state funding, especially if we know that parents are unable to work if they don't have child care, that if we're funding public funding for our school age kids, that we'd be more creative in finding a way to fund for our youngest members of our community. Which is interesting because I, I feel like some of and in times that I've either talked about this or made videos about this, um, some of the feedback as far as people who do not think that the government should be helping to fund this are saying that some of the obstacles, and I would love to hear your opinion on whether or not you think this is true, is like the regulations that are, in, uh, you know, put on trying to start a child care center or keep a child care center running. Like how much did you find the actual regulations to be an issue in this process? The startup process is very tedious. Um, okay. It is definitely a process where I always said that um, the analogy of my ducks were all floating in a pond, but they had to get in line at the right time. So one step couldn't happen prior to the other. And I think that there are definitely obstacles in the childcare industry of being able to become regulated that could could have better um, help per se. So for example, you can't open your center until you have a building inspection and you need a commercial licensed building inspector. And there are not many in the state of Wisconsin and they're extremely expensive. So perhaps, you know, finding the resources to make those people more readily available, or at least a compiled list of people who you could go to. Um, I mean, I think I've reached out to 13 or more people to try to find someone just for that one step in wow. the process. So there's some, there's some credence to that as far as like, there's, there's ways that we could make this easier for people as they're starting these businesses. Yes. And I will say that I've worked with our child re resource and referral agency, which in my area is Child Caring out of Mosini, and they provide um, any technical assistance that you need. So any questions that I need to be answered, they provided like a mock licensing visit to make sure I was ready to go so that I would pass inspection and all sorts of things like that. So there are agencies throughout the state in different regional areas that are willing to support you and help you. It just takes that collaboration to make that work. Got it. Okay. So getting back to your story, as far as, you know, you, you certainly had the initiative to do this on your own, but did not do it alone. As far as there was agencies involved, there was grants involved. You did, I know you, uh, I think I read that you had part of, you got um, the mainstream bounce back grant. There was a mm -hmm. GoFundMe campaign, but even all of that, despite how much support people had, it still wasn't enough. And so you actually took the extra step to be, to get businesses involved. So what does that partnership look like with the community businesses? Sure. So I guess I always like to use the term that the childcare industry is such a broken business model. So why are parents paying so much money yet daycare centers need more funding and teachers are making so little? Mm -hmm. um, so if you think about, you know, say you have a center of, you know, th I have 35 kids here and parents pay approximately $10,000 a year. Um, that brings you up, you know, to the $350,000. But that has to also include food, you know, maintenance, operating costs, supplies, materials, things like that, besides paying for staff's payroll. So the average teacher and uh, average early childhood educator in Wisconsin makes approximately 11 to $12 an hour, which is something they could make more down the road at Quick Trip here in you know, Wisconsin and receive yeah. benefits, which is something a small business is unable to provide. So finding a solution to filling in that broken business model gap of being able to pay my staff, what I feel is a more 
deserved wage yet still not enough is something that I was hoping to fill with creating business partnerships in our community. So how does it work? Like, how does like, what is the best, like, what do the, what does the business get? What do you, what does the Antigo Child Care Center get? Sure. So in our, t- we have a tiered model in the child care industry. Each classroom has a maximum capacity and um, being, making the system a tiered model has, sets priority to which business gets which spot at which time. So the business um, signs a contract with us as a partnership agreement. They stipend the center funding on a monthly or quarterly basis, and that gives them priority on our waiting list. So when we first opened the center, each business in our partnership had a time frame. Um, So the first tiered partnership had X amount of days for their employees to sign up so that they received the first spots. And then um, from then on, now that the center is at full capacity, if an employee of that business signs up on our waiting list, they bump in front of everybody else. So our waiting list is currently at 36 kids. If one of our business partnership um, employees would register, they would bump to the first spot which gives them a more realistic time frame. If I can't accept them immediately, maybe I have more of like a three to six month time frame than an unknown at that point. And from what I've heard through our partnership with the Anago School District is that that has been a priceless component in the partnership of being able to at least have a time frame of knowing when they would be able to get into a child care center versus not knowing at all. Got it. So I guess it we're, as we're running out of time, but what do you think other communities or childcare centers can take away with what you have found to be successful? Do you feel like this is a model that could be replicated at other centers? Actually, I have had multiple centers, um, cities, counties reach out to me about the business model, looking into how they could implement it in their area. And it It's a little tricky in smaller communities, I definitely say, but it is something that I know has been already implemented in other areas of the state. And I hope that we can continue being creative and finding ways to help fill in that broken business model. Absolutely. Because I do think, I mean, there's there, I feel like there is so much to be gained from the businesses as far as being involved in solving this problem. And this was one of the first stories, at least I heard of, where there was that collaboration and partnership. And so I'm ho- that's why I wanted to have you on the show so we could bring more awareness of like, hey, look, there's a yeah. way. <laughs> they definitely um, promote it as like an attraction and retention tool for their employees. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, Gabby Serrano is the owner and director of Antico Child Care Center. Thank you so much for spending time with us today. With the minute we have left, is there anything else you want our listeners to, to know about child care in Wisconsin? I would definitely say if anybody's interested in even opening an in-home child care center, um, there's so many resources for you and grants and funding um, and mentors that are willing to help you get started. So I definitely reach out to your local child resource and referral agency for all the support. And it's not as hard as you'd think. Well, there you go. All right. Thanks so much for your time, Gabby. Thank you for having me. All right. Well, we are going to take one more break. And when we come back, we will wrap up today's show. Stick around. This is As Goes Wisconsin. Welcome back to As Goes Wisconsin. I am Kristen Bry. She is Jane Matinair. Um, Jane, are you familiar at all with Hanlon's Razor? The, the Is it a philosophical term? thing or is philosophical, it a an- philosophical uh, concept that, is, that says never attribute to malice that which is adequately explained by stupidity oh i love it and i read this story this morning and all i could think of was that um so uh a quote from the department of defense the department of defense is aware of this issue and takes all unauthorized disclosures of controlled national security information or controlled unclassified information seriously And that does sound serious, but in this case, um, the government isn't worried about intentional leakers doling out classified docs. Instead, it's concerned about careless typists. What? 
So it turns out that the domain for the country of Mali, so the African country, right, um, is very, Which is very close. With, and it's very it's aligned with Russia, right? It's Mali very aligned, is aligned with, Russia. with Russia. Is very close to that of the military. So Mali, the country, is dot ML, and the military, the U.S. military, is dot MIL. So millions of emails meant for military personnel have been going to the West African nation instead. <laughs> Some containing sensitive information like passwords and high-ranking officers' travel plans. Oh, uh, This was reported by the Financial Times. The Dutch entrepreneur contracted to manage Molly's domain has been sounding the alarm about this leak potential for a decade, but his contract is almost up, meaning all emails will soon go straight to Molly's government, which, as you said, is closely allied with Russia. That's so Jay, crazy. Never attribute to malice that which is adequately explained by stupidity, even with the horror. U.S. military. And this guy's been talking about this for a decade. Yeah, apparently. Um, but it's just, you know, I have someone in my life who loves the everything can be explained by the, the, the higher plan, like the conspiracy, the and. And not that there's not secrets that the government keeps from the general public, and uh, but it's just, I always come back to that philosophical thing. Because you know what I also think about a lot is that quote from uh, Michelle Obama when she was interviewed of when she first got it, like the, into the White House and was taking meetings and was the first lady and at first was like so intimidated because, you know, you're sitting with heads of state and people who are heads of departments and people with these incredible resumes. And in that interview, she said, you know, and ultimately you find out that a lot of these people are not that smart. <laughs> that's, something, like, not, that's something we all knew deep down inside. Yeah. And like just the the I think about that of some of the people that I remember from tech that had very high like hoity toity jobs. But it's like you talk to them and you're like. You're just you're not that impressive um and so whatever i i hear the conspiracy of how related and planned and coordinated everything is i was like have you met people <laughs> giving them way like, too much credit right you're giving them a lot of credit to be able to pull this off when uh like i've worked at companies and like it's hard to get people to walk in like one straight line <laughs> let alone like entire cons like like conspiratorial like taking over the world or trying to keep you under your thumb is like most people just like exist within the system that they exist in instead of being able to control mass amounts of people and information. A mastermind. But, a mastermind. Masterminds. Yes. And so um, I thought that was concerning, but also kind of funny. Just make sure you get those email addresses right, folks. That's well, important. Well, it's funny because because you think about the amount of times people try to send me an email and are so confused of why I didn't respond to them. And it's simply because they spelled my name with an E instead of an I. Little mistakes. So Christian Little with things. an E, I will not receive your email. if you. <laughs> and, and apparently it goes somewhere. So if you, if you, it's Kristen dot uh, Bry and someone has that email because it doesn't bounce and people just don't get a response and are very confused um, until they text me or somehow get a hold of me and they say, why didn't you get my email? And I was like, well, how did you spell it? And they're like, oh, whoops, my bad. One little thing, so, one little thing. Spell check, people. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, coming up for tomorrow's show, Greg Bach will be here. And I think tomorrow we're going to play a game, which I'm excited about. I think we're going to... Uh, dive into the the new state fair foods and have some rankings as far as what we would or would not try. So that's coming up tomorrow along with the news. But uh, but yeah, and so coming up, well, go ahead, Jen. I just wanted to remind you that uh, when we talked to uh, our guest last week from the Waukesha County Fair, tomorrow is National Corn Dog Day. Tomorrow is National Corn Dog Day. And tomorrow is also the first day of the fair. 
I think we need to go get a corn dog after we the show. may have to go get a con- corn dog post show. That sounds that does sound like something that would give me heartburn now. You will never know unless you try. <laughs> <laughs> worth it. Yeah. Worth it. Totally I've worth nev- it. I've never been one until now who has to make those decisions as far as like, I'm lactose intolerant, but worth it to take have that cheese curd. <laughs> or like, and so now I, I, I understand the plight of people who make those trade-offs between how good something tastes and how it's going to make you feel later. <laughs> The eternal yeah. Are you willing to make that sacrifice? Is what it comes down to. And I feel like with a, for a corn a, a Waukesha County Fair corn dog, I think I could make that happen. I don't. I can't promise. I'm jumping on like a, 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 a theme, like a ride afterwards. But oh, I'm cool with that. I'm cool with that. You know, what are the twisters? What's the one like the egg crate one where you're flipping around and like the entire thing is moving? Oh yeah, it feels like an no. immediate way to throw up at this point. Yep. And, and, yes. At any point. All right. Well, coming up next is the noon newscast. And then we got Town Call. And then the Todd Alba show starts at one o'clock, followed by Matt Flynn. And then, of course, Devil's Advocates and the Maggie Dawn show. So, still a full day of great topics, great shows, great hosts. Uh, but as for us, that'll do it for us today. Thank you for calling. Thank you for texting. Thank you for being part of the show. Thank you to our guests, Dan Schaefer, Professor Huber, and Gabby Serrano. And uh, come back tomorrow when we'll do it all again at 10 a.m. This has been As Goes Wisconsin.